I am a human being and I killed human beings. Before I knew it, I'd fired four shots at the door. I kept on shouting for Reva to phone the police. Tests are underway to determine if a serial killer is on the loose in Centurion Pretoria. The dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. In a country marked by the harsh reality of 84 daily murders, these are the stories that echo through the reality of life in South Africa. Hello, it's Paul Llewellyn and I'm delving into the minds of Africa's most evil. What drives them to commit unspeakable acts and what does it take to bring them to justice? Leading the way on our journey is Jared Labaskachny, an author, former law enforcement officer and current head of LNS Threat Management. Labaskachny helmed the investigative psychology section of the South African Police Service, from 2001 to 2016, working on over 300 cases of serial murder and rape. He's an internationally recognized and renowned expert in forensic psychology, and he is our profiler. Spread the word about the show. Share with your friends, colleagues, or anyone interested in crime in Africa. Please do share. Visit us at youtube.com forward slash c forward slash profiler Africa, and please do subscribe to the channel there. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify and others just search for profiler africa follow us on instagram at profiler africa join our facebook group or drop us an email at profiler africa info at gmail.com um yeah and uh, do go and check out our social media pages we uh, sometimes post uh, uh images and um information related to the crime so uh, that we're discussing so while you're listening to the podcast you can uh, check out some of the crime scene photographs, for example. And we do have, I mean, we've got tons of stuff on the case that we'll be discussing today, so we'll put up a few things. So welcome to another episode of Profiler. Today we revisit a tragic incident that unfolded at the Rosebank Police Station in Johannesburg back in 2011. So we're going back in time on today's episode to discuss a historic case and one that was really kind of rocked the city of Johannesburg at the time that it happened. Um, and if you know Rosebank, which is obviously a very upmarket, middle-class suburb, um, it's not typically the type of thing that you expect to happen um, at the Rosebank police station. So we'll unpack what happened with that case uh, and discuss some of the uh, repercussions of it also. But first of all, Gerard, what I would like to do is set the scene for folks who are maybe not entirely familiar with how policing in South Africa is structured. Let's get to kind of how a police station fits into the to the bigger system. Break down for a, first of all, hi. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> okay. Are you well? I am. I'm so enthusiastic to get into the Rosebank Police Station. I know, and you today. love doing the introdu introduction live Every single time. Oh, you think I should just pre-record it? We just tag in, slap it on the beginning of each episode. Today, my voice, uh, every day your voice has a unique <laughs> level of gruffness depending on how stressful yesterday was. <laughs> so I'd hate for like three months ago, much happier, more kind of enlightened Paul's voice to clash with today's more cynical April Paul's voice. Okie dokes. You know? Okay, fine. All right, Jared. So please, just break down for us. You work there. How do the police work? So I think this is quite an interesting from the point of view if you're used to watching like American television or documentaries about American TV shows. Um, I, and, and, you know, your, a police service develops with the background of the history of that particular country. You know, America had its own development, you know, et cetera. We have a, we had our own... But essentially, we only have one law enforcement agency. Our constitution actually technically only allows one law enforcement agency, the South African Police Service nowadays, pre-94, it was sort of the South African Police, um, to actually be responsible for investigating crime in the country. Um, so we don't have, like in the U.S., in the U.S., there's literally like, I think, 17,000 independent law enforcement agencies. So you could, for example, travel from Hillbrow Police Station to um, Rosebank. Rosebank Police Station, and it's a completely different police service. They have their own uniforms, they hire their own people, they have their own rules and regulations, they use their own forensics people, but it's really completely independent. And once you're outside of your little jurisdiction, because um, you're no longer a law enforcement officer, this kind of, in America, this kind of grew out of kind of small town sheriff kind of decentralization vibe. of power is really what it was about. Because you know, 
the modern American history, mm. but taking aside those sort of obviously who was originally there, yeah. um, the First Nation people, you know, when sort of people came from Europe, you know, they set up a place, then the UK came over and basically colonized it. And then those people said, we don't want that. And that led to that first war, I think first war of independence, I think it was, mm. excuse my dodgy American history, where they kind of kicked out colonial rule and then everybody was very much independent. This is our, we don't want anybody else above us telling us what to do. So that became that your, your power was decentralized to like your local sheriff became like the law enforcement. Mm. And it's only with more modern step forward and modern America, the states working together after the Civil War, you know, that they had more of a federal overarching system. So essentially, those are all private, little independent. You've got local p police departments. Then you've got state, you know, because the U.S. is divided into 50 states, a state law enforcement a, a agency. And, of course, the federal law enforcement agency, which works across the borders. So it's really which different Which is, of course, tiers. the SBI. Yeah, um, yeah. So literally, I mean, you can have it where, you know, you've got, if you, sh if you assault someone on... The, on a city park or a, or a national park, it's the park police whose jurisdiction it is to investigate that. But if you then run across the road and you go on to, you know, the, 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 the lawn of the White House, that's a different law enforcement agency who's going to investigate that. And then if you run across into a suburb and commit a further crime, it's another law enforcement agency. And if you get in the highway, it's a different law enforcement agency. So coordination across these can be very complicated, like in serial murder cases where you have someone operating. So we, we don't have that history and how we basically develop it. We have one law enforcement agency throughout the country. So whether I am based in Johannesburg and I travel down to Cape Town to look for, hunt for and arrest a suspect, I'm a policeman there as much as I am a policeman here. Mm -hmm. Yes, you break it down for management purposes into little individual police stations and every area is covered by a police station in South Africa. And then often what they do nowadays, or even previously, is they group them into what we used to call districts, we now call clusters. So anything from five to 10 police stations can be grouped under one cluster, which would have a cluster head, which is typically gonna be a general, uh, who technically is uh, are responsible for those stations underneath him or her. And then of course, those clusters all get grouped into a province according to the provincial boundaries. And you have a provincial head of police. Um, who's responsible for policing. But it's still all one law enforcement agency. We have one set of laws that we are enforcing. Our internal regulations and guidelines and national instructions are applicable throughout the country. So, you know, in, in Gauteng, you know, the crime scene people can't decide that they want to process crime scenes in this way, and Cape Town will do it that way. There is a national instruction of how all things are done. So it makes it a very large, I mean, comparatively, we're a, we're a huge law enforcement agency compared to the majority in the U.S. Because I think, I'm trying to find the most accurate stats. We have like 150,000 people, if I'm, I'm talking under correction, uh, whereas, you know, you can go to a police station in the States and you've got five people. Mm. So it's a massive organization compared to almost all across the world. We're very big. Yeah. Certain advantages because, you know, in terms of buying power, you know, if you're a little police department in the States and you want to buy a crime scene light sources you're buying one or two when saps buys those very same thing you're buying 500 so you know in terms of they bargaining power buying power you know yeah. which is why we also have a lot of things that little police stations don't have i mean phenomenal forensic laboratory in cape town is like really really super modern um one of the biggest in the world uh, you know very high tech etc you know a little pd can't afford that because they just don't have the money from the local city council to buy and invest so there are advantages of having massive, big organizations. I guess there's some other ones of having smaller organizations. Where did we inherit our system from? Is this kind of, is this a, how, how, how it works in the UK? Is it kind of a colonial I'm inheritance? Not sure. um, I'm not quite sure exactly. I think the UK, I think it's less this, you're independent. You know, because yeah, that's also separate. It's divides and constabularies yeah. for this area. But I think, I think in the UK, you're still a cop, whether you leave your little, assigned area okay. you would i think still be law enforcement officer anywhere in the uk okay. so i'm not again talking under correction yeah. i think it's just really how how things i guess yeah. for for kind of an apartheid state for example having one strong controlled yeah, centralized, centralized police service is very much aligned to is is one is the best option as far <laughs> yeah. as meeting your objectives? Look, let me put it this way: I think if you're going to be a tyrannical organization, uh, autocratic organization, you don't want independent. People you want it centralized. You want centralized. Yeah. One can. That's very much. I mean, in how I'd imagine autocratic states. So that doesn't mean you know that's the nature of this police, but um, definitely you don't want independent free thinkers. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I think that's partly why the U.S. had that 
we're developing that, that we're not going to have an autocratic huge organization that oppresses yeah. individual people what's interesting is the com then the con the the challenge in that you know maybe when it comes to how democratic the system feels centralized would imply that maybe there's there's kind of more risk there mm. um kind of compromising those values that said centralized is more effective when it comes to actual policing because you've got one group that is kind of uh, aligned on solving a particular crime or uh, tackling a particular challenge mm. and that is, so anyone that's brought into that investigation then would become part of that is you know is essentially already a part of the same team yeah i mean if you look at it we've got about 1150 police stations throughout the country that spe that cover every port every part of the country um I think I was looking now some facts and figures. We've got um, about 117,000 uh, like police officers, although that term isn't quite correct in South Africa, and about 52,000 civilians who would be doing more of the administrative, um, administrative stuff. Okay. Now, um, let's then kind of get to a police station itself. Who typically are the personnel that would man a police station? Who are the kind of key essential personnel? What kind of team would you find at a typical police station like, and let's talk about a typical suburban yeah. police station like Rose Bay. I guess the biggest way to divide it would be that you'd have your people doing visible policing, so that's the guys driving around the vans, walking around in uniforms, trying to visibly prevent crimes by being present and then responding when there's a call. You know, hey, I'm being robbed, or hey, my house is broken into, a van would come out, take the statements, et cetera, et cetera. Then the second part of that, which would be your detectives who then investigate the crime thereafter. There's another cycle race this week around the parks. So the, <laughs> that's the, you know, yeah. the eighth cycle race this week that the police need to be deployed to. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that kind of stuff. So yeah. so they'll, they'll be divided between your visible policing people and your detectives. Um, that's really the biggest chunk of, and then you've got your admin people, your you know, HR, clerks, typing this, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, what level of rank would be managing that police station? Depends on how big it is. You know, sadly, I mean, if you look at it, we've got about, about almost 200, just under shy of 200 generals. I mean, I think... Pre-apartheid, I think we had nine generals. We now have, we have more than the British Army had, I once read somewhere, more generals now than the British Army had at the end of World War II. Uh, you've said that, so this before, but was, didn't you mention it as the kind of combined allied forces? Something like that. It's yeah. not phenomenal. Yeah. So, and why that is, I, I don't know. So we now have police well, stations. Well, you have your suspicion. I mean, a general gets paid more than... Oh my God, you get a big salary. Is, it not, is it not that? Is it like... I guess you could say um, rewarding more people. So now, for example, you used to get a police station that was run by a warrant officer, which is like sort of the third, fourth level up from a constable. Um, I mean, like I said, in the old days, you would have only a province maybe run by a general. Mm. Now you have a police state, a big police station run by a general. It's like and what what, uh, what what is a general's role? Essentially, they are incredibly senior managers. Once you reach yeah. general levels, that you are running the police. Okay. Um, it's you know, I so said you get like your divisional commissioner, lieutenant generals, then you get sort of major generals. That's really the top structure, the top, top, top echelon of the police. Is that right? Well, I mean, having a lot would imply then maybe devaluing that role a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of it's I mean, like in in. You know, the colonel used to be incredibly senior rank. Now it's not really that. I mean, we've, we've got like over two and a half thousand colonels. Two and a half thousand colonels. Full, full colonels, about six thousand lieutenant colonels. Yeah. Sure. Um, so we we were it were massively top heavy in terms of our senior ranks. Um, and I, again, I, I well, it just immediately makes me think what the salary bill then is because I know that the biggest of it, you know, I mean, it's not surprising, but the biggest chunk of police budget goes to to Salar yeah. to salaries. So I can imagine that that is therefore a lot bigger than it need be mm. if you if historically we've run the police with much fewer senior management yeah. um it just seems like it feels like is there an unnecessary amount of expenditure going on there so typical feels kind of normal and typical and very south african for, yeah. for these days doesn't it yeah so essentially yeah so the police 
commissioner, commissioner of a police station, station commissioner, would be in charge of policing in his or her area. They would have certain targets that they have to meet. Stats becomes a very important thing, which is why we then get people fiddling statistics to make mm -hmm. their crime look better, because um, we are chasing statistics, uh, s sadly, um, in terms of our policing. So you'll get people who attempted murder docket gets opened up as an assault docket because mm. assault is a lot less severe. Now, that doesn't mean you would, would investigate it any differently, and still the prosecutor at the end of the day can charge the person with attempted murder. But on your stats, you'll say, well, we, didn't, we had less attempted murders than, say, last year. Yeah. Instead of opening up a murder docket, you open up an inquest docket. An inquest docket is typically for something like a suicide. Or when you're not quite sure, it doesn't look like a murder, so you open up, like a guy falls off the roof, you open up an inquest docket. It still can be investigated, and you can still arrest someone and charge them with murder, but on the stats it says um, not a murder. Yes. And that we've countless times we find um, because people are being pressured to meet statistical goals as opposed to actual real policing goals, in my opinion. Yeah. And even <laughs> even with all that effort, the um, crime statistics that come out every year are awful, aren't they? Yeah. So it's Even with all the fiddling, they're terrible. Even with all the fiddling, <laughs> they're terrible. You know what I mean? They've stripped it down as kind of low, you know, to make it as pleasant yeah. kind of seeming as they can. But... Um, still worst in the world kind of kind of statistics that mm. you land on in a city like johannesburg um there is also this entity called the metro police yes yeah, well, so what are the how do the metro police fit I, in? i'm not quite what sure what are the metro police how they fit in terms legally i mean obviously there must have been looked into whether that is not contrary to the constitution but sort of your your durban jmpd durban metro cape town they're really there enforcing bylaws you know, if you're trading on the streets, you know, they'll come and check, do you have a little permit to do so? They're not there to respond to, hey, someone's breaking into my house. Mm. They could, if they hear about it, of course. Um, and if they see a crime, yes, part of their job will be to respond to it. But they're not tasked with the role really of investigating an incident that takes place, responding like on 10 one, it always goes to the South African police. Mm -hmm. um, if a crime is discovered, the police saps has to come over, then, you know, take statements, investigate it, take someone to court, prosecute, etc. So I don't quite know how they fit into the structure. The, uh, I think there was talk about should they bring them into the SAPS structure or not. I don't know. I do think that there's uh, some merit in that the city mayor has, because those fall under the, under the mayor, really, as far as I understand, okay. can task them to do certain things and focus on certain things. And traffic? Same with traffic. I mean, again, uh, I'm not quite sure from a legal perspective, but they don't fall under the South African police. So you get the national... You know, you get road tra RTI, and then you get the national traffic. So you could see these guys drive past with cars that look a little bit different. And, um, and again, but their responsibility would be more aimed at traffic-related issues. If a crime occurred, they'd have to call out the SAPS to take it further. Now, we also took a, a recent little excursion, you and I, to, um, to, to see the judgment, um, to attend the judgment for the Safiso Mkwanazi case. And there were some other uniformed folks mm. there um, that I'd not seen before. And you'd mentioned that they were called community safety wardens or mm. counting safety wardens or something like that. Do, do you have a sense of what is that now as well? So this seems to be something that, that so far is only happening in Gauteng. They wear kind of green uniforms with, I think, berets and they have a bulletproof mm. vests. Uh, no, they, they, they're kind of like to be eyes and ears in the community, I guess, to help reduce crime by having a, some kind of a law enforcement looking presence. Mm -hmm. So out there is a deterrent factor. Um, they're not armed, so you know that you wouldn't be they wouldn't be running towards an armed robbery or something. You know they work alongside the police, community patrollers, schools to reduce crime, corruption, vandals, and that's kind of like their their kind of main task. But I don't really know. I mean. I guess they're like one step above security guards in the you sense know, that they patrol around. And in the course of in the course of uh, working on the in the kind of true crime space, I've come across a, a number of folks who've spoken about the fact that what we're kind of what is happening at the moment is that policing is being a lot of policing is being essentially handed to private security. Mm. Is this kind of an aspect of that, and is that a reality? Are we seeing that? The because the police is becoming more and more dysfunctional, instead of trying to fix the problem, they're kind of passing it off to our our local yeah. security firms that we're seeing and kind of shifting the balance of power a little bit. I guess this is a way, because I guess you're paying these people a lot less. Uh, they don't have the same arrest powers as, as, as 
to say normal police officers. Uh, if anybody's offended by that, I'm sorry. Um, they can assist law enforcement, preserve a crime scene to the police arrive. So I guess it's a way of, with less money, having more boots on the ground, hopefully having a preventative role, mm. and assisting to some degree when something does happen. Yeah. Um, how good this is going to be, I don't know, time will tell. If it works, that's fantastic. If it doesn't, it's a big fat waste of money. We've employed 3,000 people. Then what are we going to do with them? Yeah. It says here they're tasked with patrolling high-risk areas, deterring criminal activity, assisting law enforcement agencies, and promoting a sense of safety within their ins- assigned communities. And I'm sure that, you know, you say that they don't have the same. <laughs> I'm sure that's not how they behave. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, I wonder how seriously the community would take this. If I saw one of these people trying to tell me what to do, Many what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether, whether I'd... Unless you're kind of caught climbing in through the window yeah, of someone's house. Kind of, you know, I don't know whether they want to pull me over and search me, I don't think, which I don't think they have the powers to do. Sure. I, yeah, I just don't know how much... Would people just see them as, you're really nothing more than a security guard bugger off? Yeah. So again, the proof will be in the pudding. Oh, what, the, the, what? The proof is in the taste of the yeah, eating, the, the pudding, whatever that saying is, is going. in the eating. Uh, if they work, it's fantastic. If they, I just have my serious concerns about whether it's going to work. Yeah. Now, let's get back then to the experience of a police station. So we've spoken a little so bit about how the structure works. Yeah. Um, we've obviously, in the, over the course of the podcast, discussed a lot of the challenges that the police confront. Um, and that the public confront in dealing with the police. Let's unpack that a little bit. Um, you know, I'm, although I'm not trying to be too leading, let's talk about what a police. You know, what you as the general public, how mm. you would engage with mm. a police station, because there's also a kind of a customer service yeah. component to policing that you can sure. walk into your local police station, whether it's to get a um, to report a car accident or a crime or to. Get a document, um, you know, uh, stamped. Yeah. What is what is this experience typically like? Set the scene a little bit for people. What it's like yeah. dealing with a police station and 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 interacting with a with with that environment. Look, I think most people's contact with the police would be when they go to a police station, like you say, to get a document certified as a true copy, to give an affidavit for a job application, or to report a crime. So you're, the average person's experience when you walk into that charge office or community service center, as we now call it. And, you know, sadly, you can get such a wide range of experience. Mm-hmm. You know, I must say that I sometimes have to go to Parkview Police Station in, in Johannesburg. And at least when I walk in there, I usually get a friendly greeting, yeah. which is a good way to start off. Um, yeah. And so I must say, Parkview, polite people. But I think the majority of people's experiences and people are welcome to post on whatever platform this is, it's like... I mean, I, I kind of dread even going to most any police station, to be honest with you, to, whether to have something certified. I just kind of like sigh and walk in and don't expect much and just hope I can get in and out of there relatively quickly. Mm. And that's sadly where we fall flat. You mentioned customer service. And uh, like I went to the other station, the other police station the other day to get something printed out for, I won't say what it was, it was approved. And they said, oh, sorry, we don't have toner in our printer. Oh, not possible you can print this out on one of the other printers. No, we can't do that. Mm-hmm. But you can go to another police station and get that thing printed out. Just tell them that there wasn't ink here. I said, okay, can I go to this particular, actually Rosebank, can I go to Rosebank Police Station? And yeah, you can go to Rosebank Police Station. So I go to Rosebank Police Station, find the person who deals with these issues. I said, hi, I was just at you know, Parkview and they said this, and they don't have ink, can I, can I print? Oh, no, that person's supposed to give me confirmation before I can print from you, for you. I'm like, well, that yeah. person didn't tell me that. And she clearly didn't contact the person. Even if she knew it, she didn't contact him. And now we're trying to get hold of that person, and we can't get hold of them. No, it's giving me anxiety. And then it's kind of like, you know, bugger you. And, you know, and it's like, and and as another police station said to me, with I know this particular person, said, like, what about service delivery? Mm. You know, did that person make any effort? Let me just phone. Let me check. Um, Okay, I know that's often an issue. Let me print this out for you. It's something you're entitled to anyway, Mm. you know. So why not? You you went through police training. Yeah. What is, <laughs> you know, tell us tell us about the month long customer service oh, yeah, course that you went through. As a such <laughs> a thing. And again, it's we it was renamed as the Irving Police Service in after ninety four at some point because it's about actually delivering Serving. a service. And yeah. now, yes, you can get amazing people, individuals who really do want to help you. They might be limited with their resources, and you might even get an amazing station in general. But that's not the overall experience. And I always say to people, it's like if, if 
if you want to judge Toyota as a brand, if they make a thousand cars a year, just for argument's sake, keep the math simple for me, if they make a thousand cars a year and 990 are crap and break down and fall apart, but 10 are amazing and run forever, how do you judge them on the 10? or the other 990 that were terrible. You're gonna judge them on the nine, as a brand on the 990. Yeah, yeah. And as a brand, Seps, I, I don't know, I've said this in court before, there's like no credibility on, so I'm sorry. Not barring that you're gonna get some amazing individuals. Yeah. And maybe here and there an amazing station, because there's great management. But that is not the norm. And you no, have absolutely. to judge the organization by the norm. Look, I mean, uh, sad to say, but my, when it comes to pass, you know, parenting, I, my advice is, when it comes to the police or my my t my approaches if you don't have to speak to the police just avoid them <laughs> do not talk to the police if you don't have to the objective is when you're kind of going through your general life in south africa if you don't have to talk to the police if there's any other way to resolve your issue take that route first mm. and try not to engage mm. with a law enforcement officer um just because, you know, like any typical resident of this city, the vast majority of my interactions with the police have been negative. Mm. And I'm not uh, the kind of person who, you know, I was pulled over once back in the day for maybe being a little bit over the limit and driving. This is like 50... Speed limit yeah. or alcohol limit? Yeah. One of them. <laughs> and, um, you know, my approach to that is immediately just to arrest myself. I'm like, mm -hmm. I did it. Arrest me. I'm not, a, I'm not somebody who pushes back in that kind of environment to start with. But even then, you can very quickly find yourself in a whole lot of trouble. Mm. You know, I had an incident with my ex-wife. I got a call one Saturday morning, which was about 11 o'clock. She, w her and her brother were driving around in, in um, Soweto by um, Jabulani area. And um, I get this panicked phone call. I'm in, I come and I've been, I've been stopped by the police. I need you drive to where I am. Send me a location. I immediately jump in the car. Now she's about 45, 50 minutes away from, from, from our house. So I have to drive. I get there. Now I get there. Now this is a black woman and her brother. Okay. And they are in the area, you know, in the area where they were raised, mm. the familia, and driving a nice car. Her brother's an Uber driver, was an Uber driver, so he's driving a very nice car. And apparently, they'd pulled up at a stop street, and um, as far as they're concerned, they'd stopped and then pulled over, and then police had, had spotted them and pulled them over, saying, "You didn't stop at the stop street." The brother's driving, jumps out the car immediately. Um, at sh the police attempt to solicit a bribe. Um, my ex, who's very anti that kind of stuff, no, we're not doing any of that. It's nonsense. Immediately wants to kind of get their badge numbers, who they are, what their names are, um, and they refuse. They're covering their badges, etc. She then goes to take a photograph of the license plate number, and they then try to pull her out of her car. So she closes herself in the car. It's summer. This is like December. It's probably about 35 degrees out. It's a hot, hot, it's middle of the day already. I arrive here now, because so I arrived to the scene. This is what's just happened, okay? I arrived to the scene. There must be seven police cars parked mm. around them, okay? Maybe 20 police officers standing around. My ex in the car, she's locked herself in the car with all the windows closed up. She's refusing to get out. Again, because these guys are trying to drag her out of the car. Her brother's outside of the car. I discuss, I'm, I'm like, guys, okay, what can we do to resolve this? You know, this is my wife, and we're trying to, you know, can we just carry on with our days? I'm sure, you know, they haven't done any, broken any serious laws that it requires six police cars and 20 cops to be here. Can we just take a little drive up the road to the police station, resolve the matter, and everyone can go about their day? No problem, let's do that, blah, blah, blah. Bearing in mind that we'd agree to go to the police station to discuss and resolve the matter. We go to the police station. I tell you, as soon as she put her foot in the front door of the police station, she, they grab her mm. and drag her into the back. Her brother loses it and is trying to box the police. So I'm trying to kind of pull him off the police and then... Uh, 
it's it's a bit chaotic to be honest with you. But she gets dragged and taken then back, carried literally back into the into the police cells. Now she then immediately finds herself in a cell, having her phone taken off her by the original two cops that had pulled her over and attempted to solicit a bribe from her. She's alone in a police cell. Nobody is a, nobody wants to say what she's being charged with, why she's being arrested. This is Saturday, you mm-hmm. know, so she's also looking at being locked up until Monday, Monday. when there's a judge available. Um, fortunately, knew one or two people, managed to get a colonel to come down to the police station and get her out that evening. Had we not, though, you know, had we not had some little back door to solve the problem, essentially what you've got here is somebody who's been immediately been stripped of their rights, thrown into a police cell in a threatening situation with the two police that were attempting to bribe her in the first place, you know, t- t- attempting to bribe them in the first place, and the potential of being there exposed to that for the rest of the weekend. Mm. You know, and this is this is a young woman who is just, uh, you know, who's who's upwardly mobile, got a nice job, drives a nice car, got a little family, you know, mm. just going about her business on a Saturday morning, and suddenly, because they so apparently didn't stop at a stop street, finds themselves thrown in a police cell. You know, it makes me often makes me think, you know, what's the difference? between that and being dragged out of your bed at three o'clock no, in the morning. That's the same. You know, it's, it's the same power. kind of thing, abuse of power. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I feel like everyone has that kind of, t- all, too many people have that kind of story in relation to the police, don't they? Mm. Sorry to go off on a bit of a tangent and yep. tell that story. But um, again, I think for listeners, it's the kind of thing that can very easily still happen here because you do get a sense that as soon as that badge gets put on, a lot of people, a lot of South Africans who have been maybe disempowered for a lot of their life, or you know, suddenly that badge gives them a lot of power, mm-hmm. and and it does seem that the South African police are very much aware of how far they can push mm-hmm. it once that badge is on their chest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, policing is just open to abuse. That's as simple as that. If you have the wrong kind of people in those jobs, you have, like you say, a lot of power. Because yeah. all you do is now your buddies will all say, "No, you were." You were screaming, fighting, you were resisting arrest, you were, I mean, you just, you got five people giving statements against you and your brother. Let's get on to our case now. So we've kind of got a sense of the police system, how it's structured, how it works, a little bit of what it's like to engage with the police for a lot of people. There obviously are positives, but I, like you say, I think uh, the overall brand of SAPs is, is, is not great, mm. um, due large in part to their own behavior. Um, let's get down to our incident now. So we've got... A clerk who ends up being very disgruntled. Mm. Who was he and what happened here, Gerard? So, right, so let's start right at the beginning. Um, and essentially, what you have taking place is in the SAPs, there's telephones in the offices, right? And what will often happen is you, Paul, will be allocated a code that if you want to make a phone call from your office phone or any phone in the police station, you first punch in your personal code that only you are supposed to know, and then you will get an open line and you make a call. So that at the end of the month, people can then say, right, here's your bill for your phone. Indicate which ones were official calls and you want to pay for those. And of course, if you've made other calls that are private in nature, you will then have to pay that amount of money. So everybody gets allocated, it's like a secret pin code. Now at this particular office, um, what had happened is that two admin people working in uh, our suspect, Mr. Kakana, and I think the other, uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember the other guy's name, we'll get it now, um, were, were charged with essentially having made phone calls using a, a particular captain, Captain Siddique's, um pin code. Because he suddenly gets this bill and it's like, hang on a minute, like this is like, whoa, I didn't make all these calls. And he has his own little investigation and, and very quickly realizes, okay, 
these two guys were making phone calls and um, using that particular number. And these two admin guys sat in the same little office together. So very quickly, so through some basic investigation, it was Sitoli determined. Satoli was his. Was the other one Satoli? Yeah, Kikana and Satoli. So essentially, that that kind of gets uncovered. You know, um, kind of this is what this is now October 2010. You know that mm. this is uncovered, and he quickly, as I said, realizes who they were and confronts them. And they kind of, I think, kind of both immediately say, "Yes, we can't." You know, we're sorry we did it, etc. But unfortunately, that's fraud because a you're stealing because you're not paying for the calls that you should have been paid for, and you know, making Captain Siddiqui now have to pay them if he wasn't smart enough, to, quickly enough to realize, hang on, there's a problem here. Um, so that's essentially fraud. And you know, police is an organization that's based on trust and proper behavior, and yeah. you're committing fraud. The uh, least sensible place to do fraud is in a police station or exactly. one of at least. So essentially, I do think criminal cases were open, but also then, of course, d internal disciplinary proceedings. And it would then fell upon Captain Naidu, who was the HR person at, the, at Rosebank Police Station. The head of support services. Yeah, to um, basically institute the disciplinary process. And that's, that's really what takes place. I mean, the, as I said, the guys pretty much admitted that they had done it, Tall in Kakana. Um, uh, they, c they couldn't remember where they got the number from. You know, but they both sat in the same office, etc. So, long story short, they were essentially, and the, you know, the amount of money that they actually owed was like, I think Kakana owed like four hundred and fifty rand. Mm. You know, it's not like, but unfortunately, it's not about the amount of money; it's about the principle. You committed fraud. We're a police organization, etc. Yeah. So, make a long story short, it goes to the disciplinary process, and the recommendation is that they are um, to be dismissed. Now, prior to the disciplinary hearing. Naidu had already been receiving threatening messages from yeah. these guys as well. So the, the, you know, they admitted their guilt on the 19th of October, and then the 25th of October, they're getting uh, She's getting messages. Um, you messed my life. Better be careful. You leave your kids alone. You tried to be a hero, mm. even where it doesn't concern you. I'll f you. Yeah. Um, and then another one insulting. Here's a fake captain. Captain insulting her heart, insulting her racially. Um, so really having a go with it. This is prior to the disciplinary yeah, this hearing is, in 2011. This is like the first one, you know, Siddiqui, really, Siddiqui realizes there's a problem with his phone accounts like the 4th of October. But the 25th of October, the first message, you know, you better be careful, you're leaving your kids alone, I'll F you, etc. was 25th of October and then yeah. sort of 30th and then the 3rd of November, 8th of November, and that yeah. does lead to a an arrest. Um, well, it leads to a, a, a docket being opened up, intimidation docket, which, quite frankly, I looked at that docket. Uh, so the, the intimidation docket was opened up uh, let me in October uh, of yeah. 2010. I'm trying to see the exact date it was opened up, but I looked at that docket, and quite frankly, nothing was really done. You know, you you sh I see there was a. a, a a request to a section 205 warrant uh, uh, subpoena for information from uh, from uh, Vodacom but there's no evidence that that was actually obtained and the source number that those SMSs were sent from the handset that was used etc it, it really doesn't seem like actually anything was done about it and I mean I can I can promise you now an intimidation docket at the SAPS which is opened up for some if you were a civilian and you opened up something like this uh, honestly, I don't think this is going to get at I anything, if at all, much attention. Yeah. You'd like to think that this is your colleague now at the station who's been threatened. You would want to put a lot of effort into it. Exactly. But honestly, um, it looks like nothing else was really done. Would these guys have been suspended at the time? Would they then have been removed, let go? I'm not too sure exactly. What, I think they were at a point suspended, but I don't know at what point. Okay. Now, the problem is you have threats being made, and you're very sure that these threats are related to this the, this action so even and this is the problem where police will look at it as well at this point we don't have evidence so we can't arrest them for this uh, but you have to look at it from a threat point of view yeah you know from a threat point of view as a threat assessment manager a threat manager which is what i've been doing for the past you know eight years mm. we would say there's a concern for the safety and law enforcement say well we haven't yet proved it's conclusively that person's like as a threat manager say i don't care if we have a good reason reasonable suspicion it's not even about who it is. We have a threat received. Do we have a threat received? Yes. Okay, so there's a concern for the safety. Mm -hmm. The fact that we haven't yet established who it is is in a way kind of irrelevant because yeah. we get a lot of anonymous threats. Yeah. And we can't say, well, we're not going to do anything until we know who the threat is 
No, mm. as a threat assessor, we have received a threat. Mm. There's things going on in the background of this person's work which could link to that. Therefore, we have to treat this credibly. But police only think in terms of investigation, not in terms of threat management and keeping people safe. I know that sounds ironic, but that's kind of what it is. Yeah. So there wasn't, in my opinion, a proper adequate response to keeping this individual safe. And thinking in terms of investigation means, can I, um, A, in the context of my greater workload, bring this thing to a resolution mm. fairly efficiently and easily kind of thing yeah. or, or and this you know this was an easy case can I tell you how I would solve it yes the person did apply did the statement to apply for a section 205 from Vodacom to find out do we have an any ID linked to that phone number because remember you can't you can't hide your number when you're doing a send in an SMS yeah. you can hide your number in terms of the call you're making that it shows up no caller ID or something like that mm. um, but that doesn't mean on this Vodacom system there's no evidence of that call and who it was made by but here we have SMS so we've got that number so then we would say, right, is this number linked to a particular person because of Rika? Uh, and secondly, which handset is it linked to? Because we can ask Vodacom, you know, and they'll tell you this is an Apple iPhone with this serial number. You know, then you can go to oh, the person you think is most likely sending this and say, I want you know, hand over your phone mm. and check the serial number. And it's like, sorry, Sunshine, this is these calls emanated from your phone. Boom. Yeah. There's your case solved. That's, that's exactly. all you need to do with this case. And it doesn't and, look like it was done. And it's one of our own. So like you said, you'd think yeah. it would go right to the top of the list. Yep, yep. Now, um, a disciplinary hearing is held. I mean, the disciplinary only happens, what, seven, eight months later. Yeah. Um, June, July, the disciplinary hearing is held in 2011. And the outcome of that disciplinary hearing is that Kekana's dismissal is sanctioned and he is informed of the dismissal on the the 19th of July 2011. What happens then? So yeah, so that's 19th of July. It's quite a bit, you know, down the line. Um, was there's more stuff that happened in between that that we what we need to talk about? Um, no, look, as far as it was just um, Naidu getting those threats, and one of the other people yeah. in this police station seemed to be implying that that person was having an affair with the station commissioner, Colonel McKeese. Oh. McKeese. So, so there were two people actually that received threatening communications in that docket that was opened up for intimidation. So he's informed of the dismissal. Like I said, by that point they had. Um, I'm trying to think if it was suspended already. But definitely yeah. from that point where they decide to dismiss, you know, they do then get the safe keys. Now, I don't know why a civilian had key access to the armory. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, don't, I don't think that's policy, yeah. and I'm Doesn't very surprised. Like uh, I, I, yeah, anyway. But one of Kakana's jobs was taking firearms to the provincial armory for repairs. And earlier that year, um, I think in March of 2011, he had booked in a firearm for repairs at the provincial armory. He had been notified a while back that it was ready for collection, but he hadn't. So now we fast forward and we have the disciplinary hearing. The process is recommended that he be dismissed. I think it still has to get the final okay by the provincial commissioner. He's informed of that on the 19th. Um, 26th of, of July, they hand over the keys to Captain Stain, who I think was one of the crime prevention captains, and the lock is replaced. Um, but now on the date, I think he's contacted again by the armory to say, listen, you haven't picked up this gun. Now, probably what happens is, because of his low level as an admin clock, he wouldn't have had a work cell phone. So he probably would have given out his private cell phone number to mm -hmm. any and all or sundry that needs to contact him. So... Again, he gets a call saying, hey, you've got to pick up this firearm that you haven't yet picked up. And they don't know, obviously, he's been dismissed. I mean, yeah. there's not this great communication per se. So on the 1st of August, he goes and picks up the firearm from the armory. And they're like, hey, Kakana, about time. Here you go. Here's the gun that we've told you to come pick up. They don't know the backstory, And essentially, he goes from there. At some point, he goes to the police station in the afternoon where he confronts um, the, the the station commissioner and the and the and the and Captain Naidu. Now, what's interesting is there's a statement by Captain Naidu's sister about two weeks prior, mm. where she says, like, you know, two weeks prior, my sister said she was very fearful for his life, her life. There's someone who's facing a dismissal who's, um, who, who makes her uncomfortable. She's concerned for her life. So we have a statement from Naidu's sister that two weeks before she'd had this interaction with her and she's worried. So we know that this was a persisting concern by mm. Naidu at least. 
Now, whether there was other communications after that initial statement was given to open up the intimidation docket, we don't know. Um, this really illustrates why this concept of threat management and yeah. understanding threat is so critical and such a, you know, it is it is uh, one of those aspects that is the more and more, the more that we can incorporate this into mm. policing kind of as a preventative measure mm. before the yeah. fit hits the shan, so to speak, yeah. the better. Um, just goes to show that there are kind of more modern and you're the expert in this yeah. field, obviously. So, so this is what we call an active shooter. Yeah. You know, we have ultimately two people shot, one dies, one thankfully survives. But, and then the, and then, well, the third person, because the individual killed, committed suicide, we perhaps jump in ahead a little bit. So this was an active shooter scenario. It's a workplace violence active shooter, no different to one of the ones you read about in the United States. Yeah. It just ended very quickly, and we'll get into how it played out exactly and, and maybe why it ended that quickly. Mm. So, but this was a mass shooting at a workplace, you know, and we, we don't often think of these things. I mean, perhaps you might have even heard of this case, but not thought of it at one of these, but this was one of those scenarios. Mm. And but like these scenarios that you read about in the United States, there were pre-incident warning behaviors, what we call leakage. There was the threats made to Naidu yeah. and this other person, threats against their life. Um, and these should have been taken a lot more seriously than I believe they were. Because yeah. yes, you've opened up an intimidation docket, but what are you doing about the safety of that individual? Yeah. You know, do we then say, for better or worse, we're going to say to um, to to Kakana, you know, you're going to work from home from now if he's not suspended. You know, what preventative pre protection steps? There were none. Yeah. Because we typically in South Africa think of we open up a case and that's what that's our solution. Opening up a, a criminal investigation is not a solution to your safety. Yeah. Not at all. No. No, it's not. Um, but, but I mean, it feels like this is the future of policing, isn't it? It's not. It's not quite. What was the movie with Tom Cruise? Um, you know where they do the future they have the future crimes department but it is very much i mean the more and more data that we have access to the more and more kind of statistical analysis that we yeah. can do the more we should be able to enter these types of t of threats into a system that then kind of spills out the, the you know the risk factor that's involved there yeah. and 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 you know the more we can do to do preventative policing, like I say, it does feel like the future of policing, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, just to g also just give a sense of where Kakana was at just generally in his life as well. He was 38 at the time of the shooting, yeah. so he's not a kid. He's a mature adult. He's been with the police for nine years. Yeah. So he's been, you know, married. You think instilled with the values yeah. of the police for a decade, married, two, two children. children. So, you know, he's got a life. And no violence history, no no convictions. I mean, we don't know, he might have done other things, but he's yeah. no convictions. So, again, we, we have this maybe this perception in our minds, what is someone who might commit a mass shooting? And, again, what are we basing that on? But you, there's no profile of, you cannot say, well, this person doesn't match what we typically see. Because, A, in South Africa, these are not typical crimes. We've had very few. We had Tempe military base in 1999, where a lieutenant was angry about something, booked out, got hold of an R4 uh, rifle, semi uh, assault rifle, um, and went on a rampage. I think he killed about six people, if I recall correctly. You see, it's not the profile of the person no. that you need to look at. It's, it's the behavior, behavior isn't it? 100%. So we typically say, if you're looking at, well, does this person match what we typically see? No. Okay, he's not a risk. You're endangering people's lives. We always, when we assess threats, look at behavior. Exactly. Behavior tells us what yeah. to be worried about. Not that his dad was a police officer for his whole life, and he's a lovely man, and he coaches yeah. the under-11s on a Saturday morning. No. You know, because we've had that guy, um, uh, Chipper Matiane from Kahisa Police Station, a fantastic cop by all accounts, mm. ended up committing a mass murder, uh, going to different locations, killing people, family members, friends, work colleagues mm. at, the wa at, the, at the one police station, and then ultimately died at the end of that day. He wasn't what you would think. So yeah. anybody you, you can be potential workplace violence, not as a mass shooter, but even just doing something violent in the, worst, in the workplace yeah. on a smaller scale. Yeah. But the thing that can be a guide, like we say, then are the behaviors. Yeah, what absolutely. They're doing. Um, all right, do we want to unpack the actual incident and kind of go into a little bit of detail yeah. there? So we have a statement from the armor says that he contacted him on the 1st of, um, of, of August 2011, about this pistol it wasn't the first time he contacted him but i guess could kind of maybe at that point previously thought, well, screw this you know i'm you know i'm not going to do, be doing my I, again i don't know if he was suspended i can't recall particularly but definitely he's contacted again on the day of the shooting hey dude you haven't picked up this pistol again um 
he contacted him. He says in his statement, I, I contacted him a month previously about it also. Um, he didn't respond, uh, uh, but only on the 1st of August, when I phone him again, he pitches up and picks up the firearm. He doesn't indicate what time of the day that was. So whether Kakana, in the back of his mind, had be thinking, I want to do this, or, you know, fantasizing about it. But I guess maybe on that day you realize, hmm, I'm, yeah, why not? It does make you question how much the phone call saying, come and get this firearm, was a catalyst for the actual action. Yeah. We know he'd threatened harm because I'm pretty sure that those that those f SMSs were him or his buddy. Yeah, I have very little doubt about that. So whether it was just like I'm now in that state of mind, I have been just told I'm going to be dismissed on a couple of days before, bugger it, you know, yeah. which is sad because he, he still had a lot to live for. He had a wife, two, two kids, you know, uh, yeah. you know, the getting fired from your job doesn't mean you can never get another job. No, exactly. Um, I mean, yeah. there's the, again, were there potential further ramifications for him? He'd been let go. Was he facing a potential prison term? Was there, were, um, there, were, there was, were there further repercussions that he was concerned about? You know, I, I can't recall whether there had been a, a fraud docket opened up. But, I mean, the amount was so little that even if he was convicted for 400, and I think I checked the notes now, 470 rand fraud, you're not going to jail. Yeah, you know exactly. what I mean? You weren't even a cop. You, know, yeah. you might say, well, if it's a cop, we might be more inclined to say, there must be very serious consequences because of the position you had. Yeah. He was an admin clock. Um, so he wouldn't have gone to jail even if they bothered to prosecute him. And quite frankly, I would have just said, look, let's just get him out of the organization. We don't care. It's 470 rand. Yeah. We're going to waste the, the court's time with this. So it's not like he's going to go to jail. Kind um, of thing you can dust yourself yeah. dust yourself but, off and pick your, pick your life back up. But yes, it, but it's it not ideal. But yeah, it also shows you, you can't say, well... Because this is a minor thing, something tragic might not happen. It's not lost on me that the victims are women. Yeah, both. Yeah, in this case, both. Now, in South Africa, unfortunately, my mind immediately goes to the root, to the to the fact that he's a man. These are women disciplined, essentially mm. creating this problem for him. It does seem that the door is often more easily opened when it's a power imbalance where maybe a man's ego is being also knocked a little bit by the fact that he's being disciplined by a woman. I don't mm. know. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of um, uh, conjecture, but it does feel like that was maybe a factor. Mm. Could be, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's carry so on. So we've got now the two people's statements from this, this case file that are um, perhaps of relevance would be Captain Stain, who was, I think, in charge of visible policing in for for that station um and the actual colonel mckeezer who survived the shooting you know um the two i mean i feel very very i mean there must have been this is a horrific event okay so here it is lieutenant M colonel mckeezer's description was as follows he entered with the firearm in his hand already cocked he pointed the fi firearm and said why did you do this then the first shot and then a second shot were heard then left the office and went to Naidu and fired four shots. Mkize went to the door of her office and the suspect re-entered her office. She backtracked, trying to reason with him. And she had already been hit at that point at least once in the chest. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he then fired more shots. Captain Stain entered. The suspect stopped, looked towards Stain, committed suicide, shot yeah. himself. Yeah. And sort of Stain's, um, not version, but his thing is, you know, he left a couple of minutes early, asked permission because he had to go pick up some pills at the pharmacy. And he kind of gets down the block and he gets a phone call. You know, there's shooting taking place. <coughs> he rushes back. It takes him about, he says it took him about two minutes to get there, parks in front of the station, saw lots of people kind of standing in the street. He drew his Z88 uh, 9mm pistol, ran inside. He saw poli policemen standing around the, the, the sort of station commissioner's office outside, the pistols drawn. He goes inside. Um, first, you know, obviously he doesn't know what's going on. He kind of points his firearm around. Mm -hmm. um, he, he hears the station commissioner saying, no kakana, no kakana from the inside. So she, he comes in. Uh, and obviously he's, he's sweeping the area with his firearm. He's like, no, stinky, because I guess she's worried that yeah. <laughs> she might get shot again. Yeah. And, um, and essentially, you know, as you, as you pointed out, that's when, when um, the suspect sees this and realizes, you know, and puts the gun to his head and shoots, shoots himself. Yeah. Um, and he says he goes into the Naidu's office and sees her lying, you know, on the ground. He's, she's still breathing. He holds her head. He waits 
uh, while the paramedics arrive, he does CPR. I mean, it must have just been from, from Kizir, obviously horrible. She's the victim of the shooting. But for Stain to come in here and find his station commissioner and Naidu that he knows well, Kakana, you know, shooting himself in the head right in front of him. I mean, I mean, the trauma, I think these poor people all around um, must have been horrific for these individuals. And let's remember, guys, this is Rosebank. Yeah, you it's know, an upmarket area. For folks that don't know Rosebank, mm. it is, I mean, in Johannesburg, probably the two most upmarket areas are Santon mm. and then Rosebank, and they're very near to each yeah. other. And it's a um, tiny police station. You know, if you go, Santon's a huge police station. Yeah, Rosebank I, is, I mean, it used to be my station. It's tiny. It's very intimate. Surrounded by very upmarket hotels, yeah. um, residential, and, and businesses. But and everybody would have known each other very, class. very well. It's really tiny, tiny, yeah. you know, tiny. And ironically, in the years later that I had to go to that police station, the, officer, the office where Naidu now sits, the, st the station commissioner's office, I office is still the station commissioner's office. Mm. The office where Naidu was sitting where the shooting took place is now the, the firearms officers, ironically. Um, office still is to this day and I once said to him do you know what happened here <laughs> Cause, yeah. and he's like oh yeah um, so um, you know very intimate little police station yeah. very, it really is very very tiny and I think you know again kudos to C Captain Stain who goes into a situation into a room where he knows there's been shots fired not knowing what he's walking into and I think that that's testimony to the to bravery not just of Stain of, of, of police officers in general that you run towards the shooting you don't run away from it like civilians who have the luxury of running away. Your job is to run towards. And, yeah. you know, for every cop who has to do that into a situation where he doesn't know what's going on, um, doesn't know if they're going to survive by himself pretty much in that scenario. And we forget about that. And, you'd, and, and this, he knew the people, you know, so that's one element. But typically a job as a cop, you're running, you don't know these people. You don't know if the person you're going to run towards helping is a bad person or a good person in their life. But you're risking your life to actually save other people's lives so yeah. just kudos to those people to do that What is then the, the the kind of immediate aftermath of the shooting? So yeah, so we have you know Mkiza fortunately survives the incident. And I do I think was shot I think four times if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Four times. Uh, you know one of the questions which was looked into at the autopsy was was Kikana under the influence of alcohol? Zero alcohol in his blood. So you know that not that that would have been an excuse or not, but you know we often know people do drink to give them a bit of courage. Totally sober at the time of the incident. Um, autopsies are done on Kakana. One gunshot wound to the head, and Naidu, I think, had, a, a, I think, a couple shots to her. Um, and yeah, but my question: you know, What changed after this? Nothing. The police would have just seen this as this is a horrible incident. Not, hey, let's look at how we dealt with this as in general. Let's look at how we deal with threats towards our employees. Maybe we should have some kind of a different way of dealing with threats. And and I can tell you now, as a as an ex cop myself who had received threats. It's kind of seen as, but it's your job. Yeah. Yes, you can open up a case and we'll investigate it, but it's your job to get threatened as a cop. Yeah. And when I told my general about um, threats that I received within, in the, actually in the Andrea Fenta case, which we've spoken about before, it was kind of like, yeah, so? That's why we give you a gun and a bulletproof and cops get threatened. If we have to try and do something every time a cop is threatened, well, you know, they'll paralyze the organization. So we don't deal very well. I mean, that feels very old-fashioned, doesn't feel like a very modern approach to you it. Know, it's like, you're a suck it up, you're a cop, dude. Yeah. <laughs> That's really... Look, there's also the aspect that if they'd kind of looked back at the, 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 the incident, it's, you know, very much in relation also to, to who has access to firearms, yeah. who is not necessarily a trained police officer. And because I, uh, it seems odd to me that, that Kakana has access to weapons, like you say, without and is not a, a trained officer, therefore has not gone through kind of appropriate firearms Does training. Does he have firearms Now, whether you, if you have access to a, to a firearm to, 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 because typically you're kind of assigned it to utilize as part of your daily task, you've got the gun. If you've got to go pick up a broken gun that you've just had repaired from the, uh, you know, from, from wherever the armor, it is, yeah. and 
it's exactly the same thing, essentially, isn't it? You've got a gun in your pocket. Yeah. Either and way. <laughs> I, I really don't. I mean, look, I, I never worked at a station, so I don't know whether that's how it is normally, that admin clerks have access to firearm safes. I would be surprised that that's because, again, t- I think we'd think in terms of the Firearms Control Act, you're going to be handling, whether it's even transporting, do you have co- firearms competency exactly. at a minimum? So I, I don't know. If I, I, I'm hesitant to say that that wasn't policy and procedure. Because any time that you're just carrying, you handling, a t- transporting a firearm anywhere, you are a target. Yeah. But does this mean that, that even, at, let's say, for example, um, you don't have any access to firearms legally? Yeah. Does that mean you wouldn't still have had a violent incident? No. You can grab a gun off your colleague and run and shoot him and run into the yeah. station commissioner's office. You could stab the person. You could source an illegal firearm. You know firearm what I mean? Legal firearm or yeah. maybe a licensed firearm that you as a yeah. civilian would have had. So it, right. yes, the firearm is important, but we cannot only focus. It's like the Primrose School shooting recently where that kid took his dad, a 13-year-old primary school kid, took his dad's gun and shot someone, mm-hmm. the principal at school. Um, yes, f- firearms control is important, but you cannot do that at the expense of saying, we're not going to look at the angry individual who wanted to go and kill someone. Yeah. You have to look at both. Yeah. And purely taking the firearm out of the equation does not mean you're not going to have a violent outcome. Uh, and that's what I just always want to highlight. But this is that, that kind of debate that you hear a lot when it comes to, for example, gun legislation mm-hmm. in America is the fact that you know, there seems to be this disconnect between the, the, the fact that if somebody has the potential to do something deadly with a firearm, there's less likelihood of it happening if it's harder for them to get their hands on a firearm. The easier it is for them to get their hands on a firearm, the more likelihood that it could potentially happen. Yeah. Well, happen with People want to seem greater like lethal consequences. You know, I mean, I mean, that, that guy still, we've had cases, people using swords, knives, homemade bombs, a brick, their hands, their fists. You know, so there are still ways that the person who's determined to commit harm towards another human being is not going to go, oh, I wish I had a gun. Now I can't do anything. You know, you will downscale to with what you have access to. I agree that people should have the rights to, to have a gun. I don't, I don't personally think that, you know, that who, who is anyone to tell me that I can't legally own and handle a firearm? Mm. To me, it's all about how accessible these things are and you know what you have to go if you've gone through a process that's 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 considered that you're going through you're going through appropriate training then why shouldn't anyone anywhere in the world have a firearm the problem always seems to be when people can get a firearm who shouldn't be able to get one that easily or like access to one like you know that kid from primrose should never his father's firearm should have been locked in a safe when only the father has access to the keys or on the father's person so yes, and I'm a fool. I mean, uh, if you've unfortunately behaved in a way where you've not complied with the law, you should be punished. So the father potentially should have criminal charges against him yeah. in the same way that the child should have criminal charges Definitely. against them. But the problem is people then want to say, instead of applying the law and punishing the people who didn't do something right, we need to, to take away more firearms rights. We need to reduce exactly. people's... And I'm like, th- but then you're punishing the law-abiding citizens yeah. for the criminals who've done something wrong with a firearm. And I have a problem with that, yeah. personally. I mean, you might disagree with me. You're totally welcome to disagree with me. So I think we've got a pretty good Firearms Control Act. You know, it's one firearm that you have to justify for self-defense. You have to go through a, a competency program, training, testing of your knowledge of the law and how to handle firearms, like a driver's license, mm-hmm. before you can even apply for a firearm. And, but if people don't abide by the law, they should be punished. And if you are negligent with your firearm, you shouldn't have one. It should be taken away from you. You should be charged criminally, and you never have license to a firearm again. But unfortunately, you get elements who want to use anything to try and re- restrict firearms ownership for sporting, collecting, private ownership. And you never get firearms rights back. The minute yeah. they're chipped away, oh, exactly. you don't get them back. Yeah, so we yeah, have to be yeah. very careful about, is this a case of the law wasn't applied properly? Uh, people didn't behave properly and they should be punished versus let's just take away more rights. Yeah. And I, we have to be very careful about a government that wants to make sure civilians have no access to firearms. That is usually, and I sound very dramatic when I say this, in other countries that we had a tyrannical streak amongst them, like Nazi Germany, mm. that was the first step. Yeah. So just we have to be very cautious. And you might think, oh, we're being conspiracy theorists. Just be careful. I think, though, I mean, what uh, seems to happen in the kind of broader general conversation and 
Um, again, I kind of refer a lot to America here because you do see a lot of these types of shootings and the, a lot of the discussion is often around how easily accessible mm. kind of firearms were and these guys have gone and bought these and they shouldn't be really military grade yeah. weapons and then gone and wiped out a school yeah. kind of thing. So I agree with that firearms should never be easily accessible. I mean, I'm a supporter of firearms. I own a couple of firearms. I do sports shooting, but I don't want every person to have access to firearms. I don't want every idiot. I think the majority of people should never have their hands on a firearm legally or otherwise. Yeah. So I'm a full supporter that there should be strict conditions. And in South Africa, you could only have one fire, a handgun for self-defense, and you have to uh, motivate why you need it for self-defense, which okay, in South Africa isn't too difficult to motivate because of police response times and our crime rates. Mm-hmm. And that you have to abide by that very strict law. Safe has to be installed, mounted, bolted to the wall, has to be SABS compliant, only on you or it's in a safe, that's it. And only you have access to it. And I'm a full supporter of, of strict, and like I said, I like firearms, but I definitely feel the majority of society should never own one. So I'm all for them. I think most responsible firearms owners also agree with those, that there should be strict control and access, and you shouldn't be able to walk in and walk out with a a shotgun rifle, semi-automatic firearm again. So maybe what doesn't happen is that we also need to take into consideration the kind of social and cultural context, especially of the time. For example, there's the, uh, is it the, which amendment in America is it that gives you, the, is it the Second Amendment? Second Amendment. That gives you the right to bear arms as a civilian, is it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So, uh, but that's, that's kind of entrenched in the American Constitution yeah. that you have the right to a firearm, which is, now, the reality, however, is, is that it, we live in quite a different world from when the Constitution was written. When the Constitution was written, you were living on a on a farm somewhere in Middle America, and you were concerned about, you know, the, the British invading you exactly, again, taking your over tribal conflicts or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, whereas today we have all the access to the technologies and other preventative measures and other option, alternative options to firearms mm-hmm. that. It should be, there should be better, stricter processes in place today to access a Mm. firearm. I agree that people shouldn't be stripped of the right altogether, but we should be applying the technology, um, the the ability to manage information that we have, thanks to all of the kind of, you know, the technology Mm. that we're surrounded by. We should be applying that more and more. And maybe it's a an unwillingness or, a, you know, it's expensive to, um, to, to, to do these things. There are other priorities. You know, it is a lot to police and manage, isn't it? And that mm. feels like it, maybe it is, you know, just people don't want to kind of commit to how complicated the administrative task mm. can be. Mm. But look, I mean, that's a whole can of worms. And, you know, yeah. you know, it's not in our constitution, so we can't say it's a right in terms of our constitution. But if you actually yeah. read that second dominion from the United States, it says a well-regulated militia be necessary to the security of a free state. Remember, they came from having just kicked out the Brits. Yeah. Um, the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed. Now, of course, people interpret that differently to mean the individual, or do they mean that there's a right for militias, which is like a crazy civilian armed populace, f- organized populace of some uh, form or fashion, kind of which back then, you know, we, yeah, anyway. But it's not a right, it's not a constitutional right in our country. Sure. Um, okay, okay. And we have to definitely be very careful about when government wants to say, like they clearly did say a year or two ago, I don't think any civilian should own a right for a handgun or a firearm for self-defense. And I think the majority of people said, whoa, 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 whoa. Mm-hmm. You guys can't protect us. You can't respond within more less than 40 minutes yeah, to a yeah, 911 call, 10 triple one call. We have increasingly high crime rates, and you're telling us you guys don't need a gun and we'll protect you. Yeah. If you said, we're going to get that crime rate down comparable to any kind of Western country, you know, Denmark, Sweden, UK. And then you say to me, Gerard, you don't need to own a firearm for self-defense. I'd say, yeah, you're probably right, I don't. Maybe still for sports, if I'm a sports shooter or a collector or whatever other criteria, or a hunter. But yes, if I lived in England, I wouldn't feel the need to have a firearm for self-defense mm. because you, you've, you've secured my society that, that that really is not a justifiable reason. But first do that and then say to me, guys, from now on, we're not gonna issue self-defense licenses if it goes up again beyond a certain percentage, we're gonna start, you know, the agreement is we'll start issuing self-defense licenses. But if we get it below, you know, 5% murder rate in the country, whatever the comparable to other countries that are mm. very stable, 
then yeah, I'd be quite happy to say, sure, I'll give up any self-defense firearm I have because I don't need it to protect myself. Look, it does seem, if we're talking about the UK, it does seem, however, that um, violent crime with weapons, not necessarily guns, but certainly knife crime, seems to be a a kind of a, a very serious concern. concern. That's the next level concern, and a, yeah. And a, re- a, a really kind of... Um, a problem yeah. that's becoming more and more of a problem in the UK. And in the UK, so. you can't walk around with a pocket knife. Like no. I, I walk around the knife, just I've always had a knife in my pocket, mm. folding knife, etc., or a little Swiss Army knife. You can't do that in the UK. I think yeah. that beyond a blade of like, what's it? I think two centimeters or two two inches. You can't have a knife in you on your on your person. And yet, knife crime is on <laughs> the rise. It also kind of you know it, go, it comes back to that like, <laughs> it makes you think about that. You know, with a kid, you know, it's like you tell them they can't do something, it's going to happen more, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So complex issues, and we have to be just very careful about yeah. the decisions that are made that we support about firearms. Um, that said, it doesn't seem appropriate that somebody of civilian non-rank yeah. in a police environment where they could access firearms training <laughs> if need be, better than anyone mm. pretty much any other organization shouldn't d- by the sounds of it mm. have access to handling weapons i mean and not have the keys to the gun safe what if what happens if kakana went to go pick up an r5 exactly or had access to the safe where there's an r5 no it would have it could very and, easily you know have been saps r5s are fully automatic not that automatic you shoot accurately but it, i mean the thing is it's, it's a high you know 5.56 caliber f- you know round there's a lot of damage. Not that I'd want to be shot with either a Nimal or a 5.56. So, you know, he could have had access to something that could have been far more lethal in terms of, you know, magazine capacity, for example, um, or distance to that he could shoot and accurately kill people, uh, etc. So, yeah. It is very strange. Let's just maybe consider some of the psychology here. It's very strange that... You feel so disgruntled about how your life has been affected and your choice is then to end your life, mm. essentially. To, that you are so enraged and you feel so hard done by that you're willing to give up your life for that cause. Yeah, that's a very tragic end for so many reasons that Kakana felt that was the best solution. Yeah, because, I mean, you're not just losing your job here. You're losing your whole existence. And not even just, say, committing suicide. You know, killing other people and well, then committing of course, suicide. Of course. Um, interesting that we don't, and I'm glad we don't, but interesting we don't see more of these types of, yeah. it feels like, you know, there seem to be a lot of these types of mass shooting incidents, again, in a country like US. the USA. Um it does seem like you know we've got a whole range of, you know we have we've got a whole bou- bouquet of of different crimes that are and lots of them. happen a lot in South Africa. But these types of mm. walk into us into an environment where there are lots of people and open fire mm. doesn't happen. Doesn't often. seem to happen that often here. Yeah. So we've had like your tavern shootings, but that is more gang gang sort of related. We went through a spate of those about a year or two ago, specifically in KZN, I think. But this old-fashioned disgruntled person who wants the active shooter that you think of in your mind of the United States, a guy going to a school, going to a workplace and pissed off about something and killing a bunch of people, we haven't had a lot of. Like I said, 1999 was in Tempe military base. Uh, we had another one, I think, in 2001 on a smaller scale in Tempe military base. This one in uh, Rosebank Police Station in 2011. Um, trying to think off the top of my head a few others. You know, the Sizzlers one was, was two, a robbery gone wrong with two robbers. We just haven't had a lot of them. And I'm I'm quite amazed that we haven't had more. Yeah, I I seem to recall in the past, me and you have discussed this somewhat, mm. and 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 you've suggested that perhaps we kind of get all our violence out in the general Quicker. crime, yeah. that it doesn't kind of build up, build up, build up, up build yeah. up, build up, and then I'm going to go to a cinema. Yeah, and snap and do a whole bunch of well, well, snap at the right thing. Just end. people can kind of vent their anger yeah. as they go, kind of thing. So yeah. So do we just react out sooner as South Africans? We don't wait. We don't bottle things up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know. We don't spend months on the internet ordering weapons and mm. storing up all this resentment and anger and frustration yeah. and then unleash it at one time. It just it happens more consistent. We do it over a more consistent On a smaller period. scale, yeah. yeah. We've got to wait, yeah. yeah. Um, 
what are your you know what are you say that like there was nothing really kind of markedly that you could point at that was a positive outcome yeah of this you know from a threat assessment point of view or what have you what what can we take from this case well i think we have to and ge- workplaces in general have to take threats more seriously have to then implement steps to protect their employee here opening up a, an intimidation docket to investigate it was not the solution to keeping people safe mm-hmm. not at all because let's say you did identify Kakana as the guy who sent those SMSs. Mm-hmm. Now you're also going to have a, a criminal, an, an additional criminal case, or at least now another uh, a criminal case against him for the intimidation. Do you think you're making? If you look at what ultimately happened, would that have made the situation safer or worse? Yeah, you d- you, you're adding to the person's troubles in the world. So that's why this is not a solution to keeping people safe. Um, you know, Kakana for the intimidation doctor was not going to go to jail for the rest of his life, so that you couldn't even say you would be removing him from circulation for a number of years to keep people safe. So we have to respond in a way of, okay, we have an employee who's feeling unsafe. What have you done to make her feel safe? Uh, what have we done to try and structure things that, you know, we can re- make sure this person is less likely to be f- exposed to harm? Do we intervene in a, a different way? Do we allow her to work from home? You know, do we say to Kakana, even if he's not suspended, okay, dude, we're just going to work from home. I'm giving you paid leave to go sit on your butt at home. Um, don't let him access back into the police station. C- you know, neither what's going to make you feel safe? What mm-hmm. would work for you? Maybe get you, get you, or at least we know there was threats. We're coming up to the point of this guy being dismissed, so that's going to be an increased concern point in time, a trigger point. How are we going to make sure that Naidu is safe because mm. uh, she's received the threat and the other person who received the threat for that time period until we know things have calmed down? So there are things you can do, but we have to have a, a workplace violence threat prevention attitude. And this is not what you see here. It does seem like the place to kind of instill this concept is in the private sector. Mm. That, you know, this is not a million miles away from the receptionist at your office. Yeah. She's broken up with her boyfriend Absolutely. and he's been sending her death threats. And the potential is there for this kind of incident to happen. And, you know, perhaps then there's an opportunity for those mm. listening to understand that in your working environment, you know, there are organizations. I, I One, for example, I would Google if you're in these kinds of issues, LNS Threat Management, a good one. Definitely. You know, to <laughs> Um, but there are, you know, it does seem like a way that maybe they could be kind of instilled as a yeah. solution that then yeah. kind of bleeds into yeah. other areas like policing and yeah. what have you. So assess the threat, determine what the concern is, what the level of risk is, and then develop a strategy for managing it. Yeah. We don't see the opening up intimidation docket is not a threat assessment and management response at all. It's yeah. make, it actually is making the situation worse. Yeah. But it could be, it feels like it could be a very uh, a standard component of a mm. private company so in all like in the states in all companies of a, above a certain size they i think they have to have threat assessment and threat management structures or at least access to people who can advise on those cases nothing like and there's nothing no requirement no, here not at all. what kind of organizations here do you find that would have a threat to say who what what sectors are you kind of the most futuristic when it comes to this well in terms of because this is what i do as a living now and and, yeah. and definitely the i'll find of my biggest clients are people in like the banking sector okay. and probably because you mess with people's money you get no, people you get the, very yeah. angry yeah. and we see that when people's accounts are frozen because they didn't fika them or rika them or whatever yeah. or uh when an insurance payout isn't made because they feel the person doesn't have a valid claim and we had one recently where a guy phoned the course and said well i'm going to come there and shoot up a bunch of people and kill myself because you didn't pay out my disability claim yeah okay we can't just ignore that you know so the bank responded we went to meet this person interview them get a better idea of what's dealing with and develop a strategy for prevent- preventing that harm from taking place so definitely the financial sector whether it's insurance to uh, banking um, but we get a lot like you say the domestic violence issues and that you can get in any sector you can be in nursery school and like you say if one of the teachers has a idiot of an ex-boyfriend who's possessive and jealous and comes to her place of work and screams and shouts and threatens and accuses you of having an affair with her, that's why she's broken off her way. That's a huge concern is yeah. the workplace violence, is the domestic violence issue. Would you be able to go, here's a set, you know, is there, does there exist anywhere like a set of guidelines? Like here are 20 rules or 10 rules that if you start to see some of these patterns or these behaviors, then you have a potential real risk on your hands here. Yeah. What we try to say to companies is you need to have a basic policy in your company that 
anytime someone feels unsafe based on something that was said, done, whether it's a customer, client, vendor, and fellow employee, that that is brought to the attention of person X, whose job it is to look into that and see what is the actual backstory, or is there more information that we didn't know about? Maybe other people are being bothered by this individual, mm -hmm. but just didn't mention it, and then assess what we're dealing with and a strategy for the way forward. So that's essentially the first problem is bringing these things to the attention of somebody in the company. And that's somebody who has the training and mandate to look into it further to determine assessing the problem, in other words. It's the identification of it is the first issue. The assessment of it along the proper principles of threat management and then deciding on the management strategy of how we're going to approach that. And yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, it starts with the policy. It starts with having trained people to assess threats and a company buy-in that, yeah, we're going to manage these things because you want to keep our people safe and happy and productive. So in lieu of there being a solution that is, oh, just phone the police and tell them you're being threatened, show them the SMSs you're getting from your ex-boyfriend, in lieu of that being a practical solution, what, w what do you advise then? What kind of solutions do you advise people to put in place if they're going through this kind of thing for whatever reason they're receiving violent or whatever kinds of mm. threats from, from somebody. The police is never a, a, a response because what you'll get is, well, okay, he's threatened you, so that's criminal injuria, maybe so, and that docket. Again, if you have someone who's angry at you, opening up a criminal case against them, I can absolutely freaking guarantee you is going to make them more angry. Now, yeah. that's not to say don't do it, but do not think that that's a solution to keeping you safe. No. Protection order. I mean, think about it. You have an angry ex-boyfriend who's threatening the girl, throwing a brick through a window. Now you get a protection order saying, stop doing these bad things. That person's not going to, A, abide by it, very likely, and B, doesn't give a damn. He already knows he's not supposed to be doing that. Yeah. So now you've dragged him into the courtroom for a protection order. Yeah. He's going to be more angry. So it's about uh, getting the appropriate people to advise you on how concerning your situation is. Now, that's a problem when it's, uh, you're an individual lady and you've got an ex-boyfriend or husband who's threatening you. You know, who do you go to get that advice? But, of course, how do you implement that safety program? So that's why we tend to focus on corporates because they typically have internal security. They have lawyers who might advise legally. They have close protectors who can, can, can you know, they have contract with security companies. So it's much more, that's why I tend to not get involved on the individual level and focus on the corporate level because the recommendations you make, the company has the resources, whether it's financial or otherwise, to implement them. That's why, I, unfortunately, sorry, people, so I don't get involved you're in cases saying, where you are. You're saying, unfortunately, the hands, you are, if there's not an obvious answer to this, it means that there's not an obvious solution to it. Mm -hmm. the, you know, so, uh, I mean, that's kind of scary, isn't yep. it? To think that as an individual, there's not a lot of basic advice we can give you. There's advice, but Apart how it's from going to be implemented. Go get some, go yeah. get an assessment mm. done. But then even the assessors find it difficult on an individual level to say, this is something that this is a surefire way to minimize this threat mm. down to kind of it being negligible. Mm. Yep, scary. That's why I do stay away from individuals. Sorry, guys, if you're thinking of phoning me because your okay, boyfriend's threatening yeah. you. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm usually happy to give some thoughts over the phone, but. Because you unfortunately become the person, he's outside my door right now, what yeah. do I do? Because yeah. who else do I phone? Uh, yeah. And that's obviously, I, I'm not a security company. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a tough one, eh? In an ideal world when laws, law enforcement worked well and we had anti-stalking laws and protection orders worked well, there's more of a state solution to your problem. But yeah. unfortunately, South African police still think, but he hasn't done anything yet. He's threatened to kill me. Yeah. He's outside my walking up and down my sidewalk with a baseball bat. Well, he hasn't yeah. done anything yet. I guess make sure that the, so your security at home is as as tight as you can possibly make it. Have as a some basic. kind of an option for an immediate threat response, whether it's with a private security company or what have you. But, yeah, I mean, I could say there's not a lot of advice then, I, you know, that... I mean, if Jared can't give you advice I'm, on I'm this, hesitant then to give it I to don't yeah. know who can. No, for sure. Um all right. Well, I mean, we talk about crime, so we can't we can't always end a podcast feeling kind of uh, feeling bright and cheery, can we? I mean, mm. it's a, it's a, it's not a it's not an ideal circumstance that we find ourselves in. I guess as a public, you know, there's elections coming up. It's about kind of changing. We've got to change the big, you know, change the big problems, and you know, and and once those start to shift, then. 
it'll hopefully all filter mm. down to all this kind of detail but and all these. What you can do is in your workplace, ask your company, what are you going to do yeah. about if I get threatened? Even Certainly. if it's by my ex-boyfriend, but he comes to my workplace, you can't turn around at me and say, that's your private problem, Gerald, sort it out. Because yeah. I'm an employee who's uh, on duty. If that boyfriend kills me on the workplace, it's the workplace's problem. So start pushing in, in your work environment. There you go. And there was, you know, um, the... Um, uh, the, go- the, the code of good practice for preventing violence and harassment or preventing harassment in the workplace that came out about two years ago from the Department of Labor. And their definition of harassment actually is workplace violence. So say, right, guys, here's this policy, here's this code. What have you done to, to implement this code? Yeah. How do you keep me safe in the exactly. workplace? Even if the problem comes from my personal life. What are you yeah. doing to keep me safe in the workplace? So pushing the workplace is important. Well, there you go. I think that's a good place to start. And um, if you're pushing your workplace, like I say, I mean, get hold of LNS Threat Management and see how they can advise you guys on um, on, on uh, what kinds of solutions you can have in place in that environment. Gerard, you know, final thoughts on this case? Tragic. Um, was it preventable? I think they could have done more, Certainly. which hopefully might have derailed this person from going down that pathway. Can't say 100% sure it was preventable. Um, hopefully the SAPS has looked at certain things like who, has, who does have access to firearms. Yeah. But again, you can get a policeman who could have done the same thing too. So, you know, yeah. um, but it's like, I think there's the cases that are tragic, but I think it, they are teaching cases, which is why it's nice to talk about this. And I talk about this on my own training on workplace okay. violence issues. Um, and we do have these things, you know, yeah. that the first thing is to say we actually do have these cases. Yeah. This is not just an American yeah. thing. Look, the reality is that you can be a, a serving police officer in what you would think is one of the safest what most well policed environments that these types mm. of threats can be mitigated against but even there you're not a hundred percent safe so be aware and be mm. you know if you're finding yourself and you know in a situation where you are being threatened be aware of of what environment you're a mm. part of what institutions you have access to what institutions you work with that can possibly assist you mm. in, and don't in, ignore warning signs in, you know help you through that yeah. challenge you know don't yeah, ignore threats. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <coughs> don't say it's part of the job. Take violent threats seriously. Don't you yourself say, "Ah, this don't is dismiss nothing. it." Don't yeah. get the opinion. Of I know, I know him. He would never go that yeah. far. Until you he know? does. I've yeah. s- I've known him for ten years. He'd never, he'd never do that. Mm. Yeah. Don't ever, don't rest on your laurels in that. You've known him for ten years, but do you know who he is right now? Yeah. with his pressures and stresses. No, exactly. All right, Gerald, thank you very much. Um, we'll be back again soon, folks. I'd be very interested to hear, you know, examples of incidents that people have been through where they've maybe had a, a positive outcome, um, you know, found a way in their circumstance to resolve the matter. Um, also, you know, where these things have maybe spiraled out of control mm-hmm. and there's been a problem that, you know, people couldn't necessarily overcome. Um you know, I'd be interested to hear. Please feel free to share any of those stories and we will we can possibly talk about them on future episodes. Thank you, Gerard, cool. as always. Um, no, well, just in general, hear about, I'd love to hear from, from our listeners where you've had concerning threats made or harmful behavior in the workplace. Yeah, you know, exactly. Customers threatening you. Really interesting to hear about examples of that because that's an underspoken, underaddressed issue, yeah. For sure. For and this sure, was workplace sure. violence. For sure. All right, Gerard. Well, I think that about wraps up this case. The uh, Rosebank police shooting, a tragic incident. Mm. Unfortunately, um, no winners when it comes to this one. Um, and that includes the general public when it comes to kind of positive outcomes that might have been sparked as a result of this case. Um, so, yeah, I guess the onus is on us to be ever vigilant. And like Gerard says, do not ignore threats take them seriously um and find the right solutions for you we'll be back with more episodes Uh, you can spread the word about the show please do share profiler with your friends with your colleagues anyone interested in crime true crime in africa or beyond visit us at youtube.com forward slash c forward slash profiler africa and do subscribe to the page you can find us on instagram at profiler africa um or join our Facebook group, drop us an email at profilerafricainfo at gmail.com. Get ready to explore crime scenes, sift through evidence picks, and confront images of perpetrators and victims. We'll put up some of the um, 
uh, photographs related to this crime so do have a have a look on the instagram page and um you can see some of the stuff that we were talking about thank you very much gerard as always it's been great okay cool cool thanks listeners everything thank we you for will, listening we will speak again soon and um yeah rest easy south africa and the world i guess if you're listening from somewhere else <laughs> <laughs>